Hello and welcome to this session on England and UK public health policy making. In this session we will explore the structures of policy making in England and the UK, explore in outline the process of policy making in England and the rest of the UK, look at some of the key public health priorities in England look at some of the key England public health policies, look at how we can measure the impact and effectiveness of public health policies through the use of key national indicators, and discuss two quick examples of the history of policy making, as well as two timelines, visual timelines, that you can find on the web that explores public health and NHS policies over the last 250 years, respectively. Let's start with looking at the structures and processes of policy making in England and the UK. We start with the Queen, who's the head of state of the United Kingdom, and she is a constitutional monarch and is the head of the policy making structures of the UK. Below her, and the person with the most power in the UK, is the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, and below him is his cabinet or her cabinet depending on whether the Prime Minister is male or female. So we've had Boris Johnson very recently come into 10 Downing Street and before that we had Theresa May, the second woman Prime Minister of the UK. And the Cabinet is the key members of Parliament who have been given roles within government and the key Positions in government include, for example, uh, Home Secretary, Foreign Secretary, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, which is essentially like a Finance Secretary, and we also have Secretaries of State for Transport, for the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, for Health and Social Care, and for Education as well as a few others that I won't mention now. So the Prime Minister alongside his cabinet makes key decisions and develops key policies. And these policies come from the House of Commons and the House of Lords as the two key chambers of the UK Parliament. Below that we have the devolved administrations in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland and in Scotland we have Nicola Sturgeon of the Scottish National Party as the First Minister of Scotland and we have Mark Drakeford of the Labour Party, Welsh Labour, who is First Minister for Wales and we have Arlene Foster of the Democratic Unionist Party, who is not First Minister, but who is the key leading politician in Northern Ireland at the moment. The reason there is no First Minister is because Stormont has been closed. It's been deadlocked between Sinn Féin, uh, which is a Republican Party that wants to reunite with uh, the Republic of Ireland, and the Democratic and Ulster Unionist parties which want to stay as part of the United Kingdom. And below all these are all the county, borough, district and parish councils in England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland.
So there you have it. You have the Queen, the Prime Minister, the UK Cabinet, also called the Executive, uh, the House of Commons, where you have uh, elected members of Parliament, and these members of Parliament have been elected by us, the general public, the citizens of the United Kingdom, um, and the Parliament and House of Commons and House of Lords is also called the Legislature, and the House of Lords are made up of members who are appointed by government. They are made lords. And then below that, we have the devolved governments, the devolved administrations, the Scottish Government and Assembly, the Welsh Government and Assembly, and Northern Ireland Government and Assembly, who within them have elected members of their own assemblies and their own parliaments. And below that we have the county, borough, district and parish councils and you have elected councillors who head those councils and then you have an executive of uh, officials who are paid civil servants such as chief executives and directors of the various departments within the local councils. So at the top you have national policy making and at the bottom you have local policy making. So how does the policy process work in England and the UK? Political parties create a manifesto of policies at elections. When they get into government, they then develop the details of those policies that they've presented in their manifestos. And governments do this by developing green papers, which are discussion and consultation documents in a specific area of policy. And once they've got feedback from a wide range of stakeholders, this is developed into a white paper, which presents a detailed draft of the likely policy or a future law, depending on what the government decides to do, whether it's just a policy, a more flexible approach to direction of the government or whether it's going to be more fixed uh, as a law and then the white papers and the green papers go to parliament the house of commons and the house of lords and is voted on by members of parliament and by members of the house of lords who can also suggest improvements to both the green and the white papers and any future policy that might come from it and depending on how the government feels, they will either take up those recommendations or they will ignore them. And lastly, there's also a range of select committees made up of 10 to 20 MPs that can look at a policy area. They might be appointed by government and there are also uh, ones that are always uh, sitting, um, which means that they are always running regardless of who is in government um, in key areas of policy making. And they gather expert evidence and uh, evidence from the general public in written and oral form and provide recommendations to government in terms of what policies uh, they would uh, should be taking forward and how they should amend existing policies. Just a reminder, laws can be seen as a special type of policy, one that stays the same for 10 years or more. Most policies change uh, every three to ten years. Laws are approved by the Queen once they have uh, passed through uh, the Parliament, through the House of Commons and the House of Lords and have been agreed by the government. Um, her approval though is a ceremonial approval as she would not normally object to a new law. And this is because Parliament is the sovereign body that makes laws in the UK. And as I said at the beginning, the Queen is a constitutional monarchy and a constitutional Queen and not an absolute monarchy, absolute Queen. What that means is she has constrained powers. She cannot create her own laws. Only Parliament can do that and governments can do that. Um, but she is the head of state and she does have some key roles, especially when uh, the country is in crisis. And her role is similar to what uh, the role of presidents are in other countries, such as the USA. The only difference being that the Queen is not elected 
uh, she has a lifetime appointment and her family members then take on the role of king or queen uh, when she steps down or dies. So the Queen does not approve most policy strategies and plans because they're not laws. Um, because she only uh, approves the major things, major policies that are uh, framed as laws. And most policies work in, within existing laws or if a new policy is developed and there is no law or law needs to be changed, then the government will change the laws first and then uh, design and develop and implement the policy. The devolved governments of Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland have responsibility for a smaller set of key policy areas, for example education, some aspects of health, uh, some aspects of uh, internal domestic policies that they make. They don't have any responsibility for foreign policy, for example, or uh, international trade policy or international development policy. and in the areas that they have responsibility they can develop policies independently from the UK government and parliament and a key example of that is in Scotland to, there are no tuition fees so students in Scotland pay no fees uh, and the health and social care system in Scotland runs a bit differently from how it runs in uh, England for example prescription charges are lower or if not completely f absent in Scotland for most individuals and then below all these uh, higher level structures you have uh, the local county borough district and parish councils and these councils develop local policies as I said before they have elected members elected councillors uh, who um, are elected in local council elections and these councillors and their executive team then develop and deliver local policies that are linked to and aligned with policies developed by the UK Parliament, by the Prime Minister, the Cabinet and the devolved administrations. So let's move on to what the public health priorities in England currently are and have been in the past. So in the past there's been four key areas where there's been work around public health, reducing preventable deaths, helping people to live longer by reducing the numbers of deaths from conditions such as heart disease, stroke, cancer and liver disease, Reducing the overall burden of disease and disability by increasing healthy life expectancy by tackling conditions such as anxiety, depression, back pain, musculoskeletal disorders and other chronic, uh, though not fatal, uh, illnesses and conditions. Third, the key public health priority is around protecting the country's health and this is, relates to infectious diseases and environmental hazards such as radiation or air pollution or uh, chemical emissions from um, factories um, and it also includes looking at emerging infectious diseases like COVID and the growing problem of antibiotic or antimicrobial resistance because in many parts of the world you can buy antibiotics from pharmacies and you can not only buy them over the counter in shops and pharmacies without a prescription, without going to your doctor, many times you also get one day, two days, three days worth of antibiotics rather than a, a full seven day course because it's too expensive so people can't afford it. So because of this poor use of uh, antibiotics they bacteria have become resistant to many antibiotics so we have a big issue where when people are very ill we don't have many antibiotics we have one or two that can help when you are infected by these resistant bugs lastly giving children and young people the best possible start is a key policy area it's about supporting families and supporting children uh, to have the best start in life through working with, for example, health visitors, family nurses, public health departments and, uh, for example, troubled family programs that are run by 
the Ministry of Justice or the Home Office. So not all policies have to come from the Department of Health. Many policies are linked to other departments and that's one of the key aspects of public health policy making that we link in with many other departments. So what are the current um, priorities uh, around public health? We're going to talk about the 2019 remit letter which was sent by the Minister for Public Health and we will then look at how these were then developed into a strategy for 2020 to 2025. So prevention and prediction is a key element of the priorities for England, helping people to live longer by reducing preventable disease and deaths and reducing health inequalities. Again, this fits very closely with what I just said on the previous slide. This has been a long-standing area of public health work. The second aspect, though, is, is new, which is about getting more intelligent and personal approaches and data to then provide social marketing messages and provide a deeper engagement with people at the individual level to help them to improve their own health and well-being. It therefore is using and wanting to use data and information from things like Fitbits, Apple Watches, other types of mobile personal fitness devices to try and use that information to help people to lead better and more healthier lives. The second aspect is around childhood obesity, the Healthy Child Programme and immunisation, working with government and industry to reduce sugar consumption, reduce calories consumed and look at working on obesity interventions as part of the NHS long term plan. The second part is about working on the first thousand days or thousand and one days of a child's life from preconception and maternity and pregnancy aspects all the way up to the first thousand years which if you think about it there's 365 days in a year so we are getting towards the first three years of a child's life and if we count pregnancy then we are talking about the first two years of a child's life preconception plus the first to two and a half years of a child's life and the key elements of this is about improving children's physical and mental well-being reducing inequalities again inequalities is always a key thing in almost every public health program and for children it's enhancing their readiness to go to school at year at four years old and at five years old at preschool and year one of primary school and also increasing vaccine uptake and immunization rates and reducing uh, vaccine hesitancy or the anti-vaxxer opinions and perspectives in communities and also extending the HPV human papillomavirus vaccine uh, to teenage boys alongside already covering uh, teenage uh, girls to reduce the impact of cervical cancer in young girls and women. Third is working around workplaces and health and the key policy around this is improving lives future of work health and disability and this work is being undertaken with local government and the NHS. And the fourth element is smoking through delivering the tobacco control delivery plan. And then we move on to sexual and reproductive health, supporting the commissioning and delivery of sexual health and reproductive services and reducing the variations in health outcomes in HIV rates, STI rates and the treatments and prevention approaches uh, across uh, England as a whole. What this means in terms of sexual reproductive health is some parts of the country have worse rates and the question is why? Why do we have higher levels of SDI? What more can we do in those areas? Then we move on to screening, particularly implementing the breast screening programme and the adult screening programmes, whether that's NHS health checks and others. And this is done because of uh, 
independent reviews by, for example, the Independent Breast Screening Review Committee panel and the Public Accounts Committee. If you remember, I talked about select committees previously. The Public Accounts Committee is a select committee of Parliament made up of members of Parliament who work on issues around public accounts and the various elements in fact many many areas of, of government and of policy making its remit is very broad then i've already talked about this antimicrobial resistance which again is a, been a long-standing area for the last 10 to 20 years and let's move on to the key priorities for public health england between 2020 and 2025 and the strategy sets out 10 aspects don't need to really worry about 9 and 10, uh, but uh, uh, element 8 is about predictive prevention, which we started off with. 7 is reduced risk from antimicrobial resistance. Again, that was covered in the remit letter. Effective responses to major incidents, that was not in the remit letter for, of 2019, but is an important area about dealing with chemical disasters or other types of major disasters public health importance including COVID for example at the moment. Five is the best start in life that was covered in the remit letter and in previous policies uh, as I showed uh, two slides ago. Four is about better mental health and well-being for both adults and children. Three is cleaner air again an area that was not mentioned in the remit letter. Two is about healthier diets and healthier weight both for adults and children and lastly or the number one priority area is at creating a smoke-free society and reducing the consumption of tobacco products. So what are some of the key England public health policies that you could look at and have a think about? So the Department of Health focuses on things that are naturally part of public health, which is obesity and healthy eating harmful drinking, smoking, children's health and sexual health and reproductive aspects which is not listed here. At the Home Office is very interested in substance misuse and dependency so there's often a partnership between the Department of Health and the Home Office uh, to work on issues around substance misuse and dependency because of course substance misuse, many substances are illegal, cannabis, cocaine, heroin, uh, amphetamines. So all these substances have an issue around criminal justice and therefore it's not just a public health issue, it's also a crime and safety issue and therefore it makes good sense for the Home Office and the Department of Health to work together on this. Lastly, Department of International Development uh, focuses on health in developing countries and how the health in developing countries can have an impact back home in the UK and how we can work with other countries to improve health and well-being globally. Now, of course, I have not covered all the other areas of policy making. For example, the Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs works with the Department of Health on air pollution and air pollution strategies and policies and the Department of Transport works with the Department of Health on improving road safety and increasing physical activity and active travel, the use of buses, trains, public transport um, and of course the Department of Health works with the Department of Education on improving children's health and well-being and their performance in schools. So how can we measure the effectiveness of public health policies? What kinds of national indicators can we use? Well, this is a really complex table and it's quite scary, but let's kind of go through it slowly. So if we start at the top, what is the vision of the UK Public Health England and our public health policy that we would develop across the whole of government? It's to improve and protect the nation's health and well-being and improve the health of the poorest fastest. So you can see the first part is about improving health. It's also about protecting it from what we from things like infectious diseases, from environmental hazards and other 
aspects that are harmful to us and it's also about improving the health of the poorest which is about health inequalities that's right and then below that we have a b c d and e and a are the two key overarching indicators below which b c d and e tables fit and the two key overarching indicators are increasing healthy life expectancy so living longer but being healthy while we live longer we covered elements of this in assessing population health and well-being if you remember and the second overarching indicator is reduced differences in life expectancy and healthy life expectancy between communities again the second aspect is a health inequalities health equity indicator i'm not going to go through all of these but what i do want to do is if we look at just one aspect uh, uh, b um, then we can have a think about how useful those indicators are so column b and the first set of indicators is about improving the wider determinants of health. Column C is about health improvement. Column D is about health protection. And column E is about health care, public health and preventing premature mortality. And these are the key areas of public health work that we all should be thinking about and doing. So if we look at improving the wider determinants of health, we find that the objective is to improve, uh, make improvements against wider factors which affect people's health and well-being and health inequalities. And the key top five indicators are supporting children in low-income families uh, increasing school readiness and being able to do well at school as soon as you get in 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 preschool at four years old and in year one at five years old reducing pupil absence um, reducing the numbers of first-time entrants to the youth justice system now you can see here this is a public health uh, indicator but it's also a home office crime and justice and safety indicator and the fifth one is 16 to 17 year olds not in education employment or training again reducing the numbers of 16 to 17 year olds who are not in education employment or training and we can work down and if you look uh, there are things that we talked about in assessing population health and well-being violent crime b12 uh, levels of offending and reoffending homelessness b15 fuel poverty b17 and things we've discussed in other modules like public mental health and well-being and promoting mental health and well-being social isolation and loneliness so there are some very good and interesting indicators and it is worth you having a look through these and thinking about it and reflecting on which of these indicators is relevant to the policy that you might be thinking about in relation to your final module assignment So let's move on to some two quick examples of the history of policy making in two specific areas and also then also look at two timelines that you could then spend some time looking at and exploring. So let's look at health inequalities. This has been a major strand of work since the 1980s. So let's see how this has happened. But before we do that, let's just remind ourselves what is health inequalities and what is health equity. I hope you do remember that. We talked about it in year one, but it feeds through into year two and year three. So health inequalities can be defined as differences in health status or in the distribution of health determinants between different population groups. So there's two parts. One is about your health status, your, how you feel about your health and whether you've got a physical health or mental health uh, disability. And it's also about health determinants. It's also about health determinants. It's also about health determinants. And health equity is the absence of avoidable or remediable, which means treatable or we can do something about differences among groups of people, whether those groups are social groups, economic groups, demographic groups or geographic groups. Now, remember, demographic is about age, sex, ethnicity. Social groups are socioeconomic groups. You can think about uh, it could also be cultural groups in terms of uh, different faiths and economic in terms of income and education and geographic. Uh, we know that in England, the north of England tends to be worse off, uh, is less healthy than the south of England. So there are geographical differences in health. 
Health equities therefore involve more than inequality. They also uh, entail a failure to avoid or overcome inequalities uh, that infringe on fairness and human rights. So inequity and equity are about fairness. Are the inequalities fair? And that's a really important thing because many inequalities we can do something about and often they are unfair and they are to do with the kind of society we live in, the kind of social and economic structures that we have that makes pe some people always stay at the bottom and some people always stay at the top or some people are able to succeed while others, despite how much support and help they get, they always seem to find challenges in their lives. And this is a visual demonstration, it's a bit a few years old, uh, 2014, but it's still uh, valid today because the differences have not changed in the years since 2014. And you can see here the difference between Guildford and Waverley, which is in the south and in the southeast, if I'm not mistaken, and Bradford, which is in the north and in the northeast in particular, which is the, even taking account of northern England, the northeast of England is worse off than the northwest of England. There is an almost 20 year life expectancy, healthy life expectancy difference between those two areas that is a huge gap so in Guildford and Waverley you can aim to live up to 71 years uh, with a physically healthy and mentally healthy life while in Bradford you're only going to live physically healthy and mentally healthy up to 51 years and after that you're likely to have some kind of physical or mental health disability or chronic condition now this doesn't mean everyone will get it but it means that many more people in Bradford are unwell after the age of 50 compared to people in Guildford So what are the key reports that have governments have commissioned that have informed public health policies around health inequalities? It started in the 1800s, in the 19th century and in the 1840s, 1850s, there were efforts to look at inequalities and the two key people are Edwin Chadwick and his report on the sanitary conditions of the labouring population of Great Britain and uh, Friedrich Engels and his report or book the condition of the working class in England and these two reports looked at the industrial revolution and how people working in industry at that time including children were working in very bad conditions and living in very bad conditions in slums in poor housing despite the large amounts of money and profit that the uh, factories were making uh, at that time then in the 1940s, there was a post-Second World War consensus in the UK um, around the phrase, a home fit for heroes, which created the conditions for the National Health Service. Because before that, before that, there was no National Health Service. There was no free health care. Before the 1940s, you had to pay. And often there were insurance schemes or where you paid small amounts some money to your local GP and in return he would provide or she would provide a range of services but things were not free uh, like they are today and then the first major report uh, since the 1800 came in the 1980s and it was a black report uh, inequalities in health uh, it was the first report to look at inequalities in the UK context and internationally and unfortunately because of uh, the ideological political perspectives of the Conservative government at that time, uh, the report was suppressed for quite a while and the discussion was shifted from issues around health equity and fairness to more neutral objective terms around variations in health. So that's where the difference between health inequalities and health equity came about because there was a political push to say well let's talk about just differences in health not talk about unfairness in those differences in health then in 1998 uh, with the, the government of Tony Blair the 
Atchison report on the independent inquiry into inequalities in health was developed and it was a follow-up to the Black report. And then in 2004 we had the Wanless report and Wanless is interesting because Wanless was a, a chief executive, was someone from the private sector and he took a very broad view and he wrote two reports and the first one was securing good health for the whole population it's a really interesting read um, even though 2004 sounds a long time away uh, there are some very useful interesting and insightful things in that report then in 2006 there was the stern review and again stern was a, a banker if i'm not mistaken and he wrote the economics of a climate change again to developed under the government of Tony Blair and this was a very important report looking at the health implications of climate change as well as the economics of climate change and the importance of doing something about climate change from a health and economic perspective. In 2010 under Prime Minister Gordon Brown we then had the Marmot report for England Fair Society and Healthy Lives and more recently 2010 commissioned by the Health Foundation the Marmot report 10 years on. So you can see here, since the 1980s, the 90s, the 2000s and the 2010s. So over the last 40 years, there has been a consistent discussion, debate around the issues around health inequalities and health equity. And these have informed not just health policies, but also policies across government. Now, let's look at some of the key health policies and broader health reports more specifically related to public health topics so the first main public health policy document uh, of the last 40 years or 35 years or so was promoting better health in 1987 that was followed by the health of the nation a strategy for england in 1992 and i think this was a report that i remember that i had a look at that i felt a part of that i reviewed um, and it was you could see from the title a very nice kind of broad encompassing policy document and then we had a follow-up to that in 1999 saving lives our healthier nation and then we had the Tackling Health Inequalities, a program for action specifically focused on health inequalities rather than broad areas of public health. Then we had Choosing Health, Making Healthy Choices Easier in 2005. And this was still part of a Tony Blair government. And then we had Tackling Health Inequalities 10 years on in 2009. And then we had Healthy Lives, Healthy People 2010, and this was uh, the government of David Cameron. And more recently, 2015 to 2020, while there hasn't been a lot of policy, many of the policies that are currently active came from the policies developed in 2010. The current main policy is All Our Health, Personalised Care and Population Health. And you will find that there's a range of documents, web pages around uh, the All Our Health branding, the links to things like sexual health, uh, obesity, harmful drinking, substance misuse and other things. So please have a look at that. This would be uh, one starting point for your discussion of policy. And you can obviously look in and look at other policies of the past and how they may have informed current policy. So the focus of public health has changed over the last 200 years and it's gone from one thing to another and then back again to that earlier thing. And so we've moved from a focus from the wider environment to a more stronger, greater focus on individuals and their lifestyle. And that is still with us. Um, the We recognise the importance of the wider environment, physical, social and economic. But often there is a strong focus with most public health work around individuals and their lifestyles and ignoring the physical, social and economic aspects that which constrain, restrain, restrict, oppress individuals and create challenges in how they can lead healthier lives. 
Remember, lifestyles is a problematic word because no one chooses their unhealthy lifestyle. It's very rare that someone chooses that kind of lifestyle. Often it's the social, economic, personal constraints that they have that make them take up those choices, those unhealthy choices. And the reason we moved to this individual approach was because it was politically more acceptable. It focused the problem of health and well-being on the choices of individuals and the in choices that individuals made rather than the way society is organised and the institutions, services and opportunities a society through its government provides. It also shifted the responsibility from business and the bad activities and bad um, ideologies that certain businesses have pushed for example um, there was a point around 15 20 years ago where there was a big push around something called alcohol pops which were sweet tinned alcoholic drinks with very bright colors i think the current version of that is uh, wkd uh, for those of you who might have seen it so these alcohol pots were specifically targeted at teenagers and young people to try and entice them into drinking and to drinking a lot because they were sweet and rather than bitter uh, most uh, alcoholic drinks are savory uh, for those of you who don't haven't dr taken a drink and so it's because normally before people have or have experienced alcoholic drinks we often think that they are similar to soft drinks and have a sweet flavour. Now, some alcoholic drinks do, but most don't. And so this is a kind of bad behaviour, if you like, of businesses where the profit motive pushes them to do things that are not good for uh, public health. And similar, the same issues with food, where your high sugar um, products are increasingly marketed and especially marketed at children and certain high fat, high carbohydrate, refined carbohydrate products are pushed especially onto children. However, there's been a more recent shift back over the last 20 years. It's been slow uh, but steady on re-recognising the importance of the wider environment. And we can recognise this with COVID where you know we understand at the moment that this virus came from a wet market a wet market is where a market where live animals are sold and potentially wild animals who that are alive are sold for uh, for eating and this happened in one part of china so it's not all parts of china and f somehow from that small incident uh, the virus has spread globally and that is quite amazing to think about it that uh, something that 500 years ago would not really have happened because people lived very locally uh, uh, in this 21st century it only took a month and it was already global this discussion this analysis that i've given here which is what this slide is can be seen if you look at the content of the policies on the previous slide uh, that i talked about i'll just show you quickly so just a reminder so these if you look at these and the key one you can kind of see where the shift is is in the 2005 document which says choosing health making healthy choices easier so this kind of goes against uh, most discussions about health inequalities that this is specifically on saying, oh, it's about making good choices. And that shows you that individual lifestyle approach to public health in some of those policy documents. Not That's not the only one. Uh, there are others that have a similar bent. And we currently still have a very individualistic approach to health and well-being. So historical listings, as I have done, I haven't talked too much about them because it can become boring uh, unless you actually look at the policy documents and you have taken interest in them and actually read the originals. Um, they can seem boring when someone talks about them, but it is really important. And the reason it's important is for two reasons. It helps us to better understand how something becomes a government priority. 
and how policies have changed over time. What has driven those changes? How have they been influenced? Which actors, which stakeholders, which social and economic factors and which political issues have influenced and changed and prioritised different kinds of policies? And through this analysis, hopefully, the end goal that we all have, including people in government, is how we can improve policy making and make better policies around health and well-being. So just last couple of slides, let's look at two timelines. They're visual timelines. They're really nice. I particularly like both of them. I like the first one more than the second one but that's because I'm a public health person. So the Health Foundation has a lovely policy navigator and it starts from uh, briefly 1600s to 1842 and then in more detail it goes onwards. It is a fantastic, and I really mean that, fantastic. We may have seen it this in other modules. I know we've mentioned it perhaps in some other uh, uh, modules in previous years but it is really worth looking at it's an excellent resource uh, and, and some good learning in there and the second one uh, which i found recently was this one by the nuffield trust which is a discussion from the 1940s onwards of the nhs and there's also a little quiz in there so you could read through it and do the quiz and see how the nhs was formed and what were the influences on how it the idea of the NHS and the policies around the NHS have developed over the last 80 years. Well I hope you enjoyed this session as much as I did and I look forward to talking with you uh, in class in the teaching sessions and um, in my next video session. Um, just a reminder to try and look at the other materials in the investigate uh, section as well as do some googling about the topics that we've discussed in this video session. Thank you for listening and uh, look forward to seeing you next time. Bye bye.